Did you know that type 1 diabetics can eat whatever they want, whenever they want, and still see nice blood sugars? It's possible. In today's episode, I want to walk you through how I count carbs when I go to eat out. Now recently, my family, my in-laws came into town, visited us. We went out to two different restaurants in the same day, and I want to tell you how I stayed in range, including the different variables that led into that. All right, let's get to our theme song. I've spent the last 10 years pushing the limits while identifying trends and patterns in my type 1 diabetes management. Follow along as I learn, apply, and share the fitness, nutrition, and lifestyle strategies that I've learned from diabetes experts around the world. The real question is, how can we live fearlessly with diabetes while maintaining stable blood sugars? This podcast is here to give you the answer. My name is Matt Vandevecht, head coach and co-founder of FTF Warrior, and welcome to Part of My Pancreas. So, as you can probably tell if you're watching, things look wildly different than they normally do. Over the last week, I did a bunch of research on sound technicians and sound absorption and diffusion and all this great stuff because we had a gnarly echo in the last uh, recording that I did. So now, it's officially a studio. We've got recordings, we've got dual screens and all the fancy stuff, and just in time too because today I want to talk to you about how I count carbs when there is no carb count, right? Now I'm sure if you're watching this video, you're at least familiar with type 1 diabetes and the fact that we need to know how many carbs are in the foods that we eat, right? We need to know our insulin to carb ratios, which is how much insulin should I take for how many carbs I'm going to eat. And the ratio might look something like 1 to 10, where you have one unit of insulin equals 10 grams of carbs, and that covers an essentially balance, right? It keeps your blood sugars nice and stable, ideally. It doesn't always go that way, of course, but in today's video, I'm going to walk you through what uh, a recent experience that I had where my in-laws came and visited us, my wife and I, and we took the day to explore the town with them. We recently moved, which is why everything looks different here, and uh, over the course of that day, went out to eat at two different restaurants, one with the in-laws, and the other was uh, just a nice date night between my wife and I. Now, the first restaurant we went to was surrounded with external variables that are not constant with my daily life. And if you followed me for a while, you know that I obsess over blood sugar analytics, different variables, how they impact our blood sugars, right? Exercise, different types of exercise, different types of foods, our sleeping patterns, our hydration, these all come together to impact our blood sugars, our insulin sensitivity, a number of different things. But what you wanna know right now is that before we went to lunch, my father-in-law helped me move our old refrigerator. That thing was heavy. So we had to go to Home Depot, and I'll tell you, if you walk around Home Depot, the grocery store, Lowe's, it's named Lowe's for a reason, because it makes you go Lowe's. <laughs> Anytime you walk around any big department store or warehouse, there's a good chance that you've probably seen blood sugars drop, right? Right. Now there's a reason for that, but I don't have time in this episode to get to it, because we're talking about food, but know that before we went to lunch, there were other variables at play. I had heavier activity, right? We moved the refrigerator out of an old apartment into the new apartment garage. Uh, we walked around the town for a bit, explored. There's a couple things that led into our lunch blood sugar, which was very smooth, very nice. And of course, I took actions leading into that, you know, including a temporary basil that I set, uh, a, a very specific snack that I chose to eat before we got to lunch to keep me stable through the refrigerator moving, but going into lunch. I knew we would have minimal carb counts, right? My wife wanted to go to this taco truck that was in our old neighborhood, and it is the bee's knees. I mean, these guys know how to cook. It was delicious. So we knew it was great. We wanted to show off to uh, her parents and show them that the good food that was in our old neighborhood. So we went and got some tortas, some tacos, and it was, I had the brisket. Uh, most of us had brisket, actually. My father-in-law got brisket and chicken, and uh, we took that food to a local winery that the street taco guys had actually partnered with. Pretty cool. But now we're getting into a whole new situation, right? What happens when you pair food with an unknown carb count with alcohol? Now we're talking. These are mixing some variables here, right? Alcohol, this might have to be a completely separate episode, but I'll let you know, it does impact blood sugars, and you need to be aware of that, especially if you're planning on having more than one glass of wine, more than one beer, whatever it is. But in this certain circumstance, I chose to have one glass of wine with my lunch. And uh, for those of you who are curious, does red wine pair with Mexican food? The answer is yes. <laughs> that was my first attempt, and it was pretty good. 
uh, but this meal, I'm looking at it, and of course we got the uh, the torta, and with this food, I've actually had it before, so I've had the chance to experiment with it. So for this first meal, I'm gonna let you know that I went into this meal having a good idea of how many carbs are gonna be in this thing, right? I knew what was in there for ingredients. Uh, there was corn, there was pico de gallo, there was the torta itself, the meat, the cheese, um, some sauce, right? Like I knew the ingredients that were in there. And I knew roughly the portion sizing. So for me, I looked at that and I said, okay, torta is about 50 grams of carbs, five zero. Now it's not gonna be the same across the board. You need to understand that. Uh, everyone makes them a little differently, right? But in addition to that torta, I knew that I wanted more food. So I actually brought a little bit of food in my backpack because I'm a big guy, I eat a lot of food. And so I actually prepared a wrap, a veggie wrap before we left home. It was a tortilla, it's avocado, bell peppers, a bunch of great stuff in there that I paired with the torta. So uh, I was the weirdo at the winery that pulled a wrap out of my backpack and <laughs> threw it on my plate because I eat a lot of food. So here's an interesting concept that can be used as a strategy, though I recognize that it's not common for most people, I paired my food from home with the food from the street tacos because I knew that the street tacos weren't going to fill me up, right? And so for me, going into that, I knew the exact carb count of the wrap. I made that myself. Pairing that with the torta, which I could guesstimate based on previous experiences, I was pretty sure it was around 50 carbs. Now the alcohol, of course, has its own effect, so I had to take that into consideration, adjust my insulin timing, my dosage, based on those factors surrounding, of course, taking into consideration the, the exercise beforehand, right, which can boost insulin sensitivity. See, there's a lot of moving factors here. So this is why blood sugars, they're not usually cooperative until you understand the moving pieces behind the blood sugar equations, behind the blood sugar formulas, right? And I teach a blood sugar formula known as the 80-20 blood sugar formula. And while well, I don't have time to get into that in depth, obviously I, I don't have hours to teach you all these things, but essentially if I were to simplify, if I were to oversimplify what that formula is, what I teach my type one diabetic clients, it's essentially how to simplify diabetes, essentially put in as little effort as possible to get the most results possible so that we can function at a normal level and enjoy the rest of our lives, right? That's the goal behind what I teach. The goal of what I give my clients is, hey, here's a few of the moving pieces that you can focus on that are the biggest movers that will help you to identify your blood sugar trends and patterns and shifts so you can take a step back and go, you know what? Let's go out to lunch. I want to enjoy some food and then enable you to stay in range longer. That's the goal of what we do. So looking at this plate, right, I got the, the wrap itself, which was about 40-ish grams of carbs. The torta, which is about 50 grams of carbs. We're looking at about 90 grams of carbs, full meal. And we're not gonna throw any judgment on low carb, mid carb, high carb, whatever you follow, because all food is good food. That's what I follow. And uh, post meal, blood sugars, I'll tell you, they cooperated nicely. Uh, we had a walk afterwards, walk back to our car, walk through the, uh, the old neighborhood, and uh, had a great afternoon with the in-laws. And then my wife and I had reservations that night for a date night. And here's where it gets interesting. And I know this is why you came to this episode because dinner was a completely new restaurant with absolutely no carb counts anywhere to be found. <laughs> I searched the internet. I scoured it because you know what? Tip number one from this episode that I want you to take away is that you can usually find chain restaurants and their nutrition facts online. So if you're ever wondering, Oh my gosh, okay, we're going out to Chipotle. How many carbs are in this Chipotle burrito? How am I supposed to figure that out? I can't see inside the burrito. What am I supposed to do? Deconstruct the burrito? No, that's, that's going to be a huge mess. I can't do that just to figure out the carb counts. I'll just guess. Hold on. Hold your horses. You don't have to guess on chain restaurants like Chipotle. In fact, if you Google Chipotle nutrition facts, I'm pretty sure it's like the second option. You'll have to find it for yourself. But there's an option where you can actually build your burrito, build your burrito bowl, and it gives you the exact carbs, fats, and proteins so that you can dose appropriately for those meals. If you go to something like the Cheesecake Factory or McDonald's or uh, Olive Garden, like whatever is your jam, you can find the nutrition facts online for chain restaurants. But if it's a hole-in-the-wall restaurant, if there's one location, that's where it gets tricky. That's where there's typically no nutritional information. So what do we do? 
we can look at our plate. Actually, we'll start earlier. We look at the menu, look through what we want, right? Find that one looks delicious. What's going to be in the carbs? What's going to be the fats, the proteins? And yes, I did say fats and proteins because believe it or not, you actually do need to take those into consideration. Your fats and proteins are going to adjust the absorption timing of the food, which means you have to adjust the insulin timing. You may need to actually uh, adjust the actual dose itself of insulin. That's right. High enough content of proteins and fats might need you to adjust your insulin dose. It is no longer just an insulin to carb ratio, but that is way over our heads for this episode. We'll get that one in a different episode. We'll tackle it and give it its own title. But for now, the carbs. How do we determine the carbs in a meal? So I'm looking through the menu, see a couple great options. This place is delicious looking foods, the pictures are awesome. Looking around other tables, my mouth's just watering. There's burgers, there's sandwiches, there's pasta. I'm like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna get, right? And I'm looking through the menu and I spot it. I spot the one for me. Blackened ahi tacos. Some ahi tuna, it's coming with some rice, some, uh, some cabbage, some guac, some cheese, some pico de gallo. There's all sorts of great stuff. There's a couple tortillas that come with it. And in that meal, I'm looking at sauces. I'm looking at every single piece of that, uh, that menu item, right? Because even in the sauces, there can be a significant amount of sugars, of fats, because they want to make it taste good, right? So I'm looking at that, getting an idea of what's going to be on that plate. I see rice. That's higher in carbs. I see tortillas. That's higher in carbs. I see guac. That's higher in fat. I see ahi tuna. That's higher in protein. So I'm starting to piece together the meal in my head. Okay. And this is, of course, based on previous experience, right? I am a nutritionist and a master fitness trainer. So I have the existing knowledge behind that. And you're thinking, Matt, how am I supposed to know what's in this stuff? I don't have that knowledge. I just like to pick from in my brain, right? Totally fine. That's where ba -ba -na -na, Google comes super handy with all of those searches. You can look up uh, ahi tuna, you can look up tortillas, you can look up rice, and you can try and find how many carbs, fats, proteins are in those items. Now another fantastic tool that I've used myself, my fitness pal. There's also a, a ton of different apps out there that you can count your carbs, your fats, your proteins, get an idea for the macronutrients that are inside of them. Uh, look at total calories, right? Tons of apps across the board. All the weight loss apps have those things too. That's a great place to search for your food items, even the restaurants themselves sometimes. For example, if you find a restaurant that's not located on Google for the nutritional facts, but you search, search it on those apps, if I search it on my fitness pal, there's a chance somebody else has already entered that into their database and given you the carb counts, given you at least what they guess was the accurate data for that. Now, one side note, I know we're getting kind of deep here, but one side note on that is that you may find information, believe it to be true, but it is not. What I mean by that is somebody might try to help and say, oh, that burrito is 120 carbs. When you look at the burrito, it's like two inches long. And you're like, that's, <laughs> that's not 120 carbs. Are you kidding me? It's, that's a bite. It's a single bite. And that's when you can kind of get a little bit, that it gets tricky, right? So take everything on those apps with a grain of salt. Sometimes they do allow user input. And if they do, you might have to compare and contrast a few different searches. See what a few different users have put on there. See what Google has to say. See what Calorie King has to say. And find the average. Find what you believe to be true. And the other option here, and lucky for me, my tacos were actually a build-it-yourself plate. I didn't fully realize that when I ordered it. But they give you all the ingredients and you build the tacos yourself which is actually really helpful for counting my own macronutrients, my carbs, fats, proteins, because I got to see the deconstructed version of all the foods, how much of each food there was. Now here's why that's super helpful. When I can visually see each of the different items, I can count in my head based on measurements that I've already gotten used to. Now, why would you be used to measurements? You're not a chef, right? Why would you ever know what a cup of rice looks like? Because you should be measuring at home. Oh, I know that's not fun to hear, but guess what? If you are not measuring your food at home, why would you expect stable blood sugars? If you're guesstimating on every single meal, when you have the opportunity to either measure or weigh your food to get the accurate carb counts, if you refuse to do that, why would you have perfect blood sugars? Let's just be real for a second. Right? 
You need to put the work in if you expect to see the results. So if you are at home, you have the ability to grab a measuring cup, to grab a digital or analog food scale, to get the accurate carbs, and you choose not to do that, then it's a guessing game. It's no wonder why blood sugars sometimes seem to do frustrating, mysterious things. Well, now we know why, right? It's because you're not taking the time to measure it. There's a great saying that says, what gets measured gets managed. Could not agree with that more. Now, back to the restaurant. I'm looking at my plate. I'm seeing mounds of different foods, right? We've got the rice, the guac, the cheese, the pico de gallo, the cabbage, the tortillas, uh, all these different types of foods. And you're thinking how, or you might be thinking, how are we gonna calculate how much of each thing is without measuring cups? Our hands. This is where it gets fun. This is where this episode is gonna get real juicy. You ready? Our hand is magical when it comes to measuring food. Now, what I want you to imagine is if there's a mound of rice on my plate and I reach in and I grab that mound of rice and I hold it in my hands, I can measure, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> you don't have to grab your food. Please don't. That's gonna just cause a scene. What you can do though is with your hand, different pieces of your hand can actually be used as a visual representation of what the measuring would be on your plate. I'll give you an example. If you look at a cupped hand, that's roughly equivalent to a half of a cup measurement. So if you look at what would fit in my cupped hand, oh, that amount of beans, right? And if I can say, okay, those black beans would all fit in my cupped hand, it's about a half cup. Half cup of black beans is equivalent to 22 grams of carbohydrates. Well, you're in my thinking like, Matt, how do you know that there are 22 grams of carbohydrates and a half cup of black beans? Because you Google it. <laughs> it's starting to add up now, right? So if I look at, What's a half cup on my plate? What fits in my hand? Okay, half cup of black beans would fit in my hand. Now I go to Google. Hey Google, how many carbs are in a half cup of black beans? I'm pretty sure it just heard me. Here's information for Healthline. <laughs> how cool is that, right? I'm gonna exit out of that search, but it actually showed 22 grams of carbohydrates. So you can literally ask your phone or Siri or whatever the heck you use, figure out what is a half cup on your plate and then ask your phone. I know you have your phone at dinner. You shouldn't be looking at it during food time with other people, other loved ones, but you do sometimes, right? So a half cup is roughly what fits into a cupped hand. Let's keep going though. If we close our fist, as if you're gonna punch someone, you wouldn't, because you're not violent, right? But if you were, you make a closed fist, this is roughly one cup. I kid you not, looking at my plate, I closed my fist and I hovered it over the rice. And I said, hey, we've got a match, right? My fist was the same size as the mound of rice on my plate. Did I pick it up and grab it? No, you do not have to do that. But getting a visual representation, my fist, roughly the same size as the mound of rice, means what? I can Google that. What is one cup of carbohydrates and rice? Or I, I said that wrong, but what is one cup of rice in carbohydrates, or how many carbs are in one cup of rice, however you want to, however you want to phrase it, there we go, gets you your answer, which for me, 45, right? Super simple. One cup of rice, about 45 grams of carbs. So I'm doing this as I'm working my way around the plate. Is it a half cup? No. Is it a full cup? Yes. Cool. What's a full cup of cabbage? Ah, about five carbs, right? Full cup of pico de gallo, five, maybe 10 carbs, right? Uh, looking at the guac, uh oh, it's not a half cup or a full cup. It's a small serving. Well, how do we figure this out? We can look at different areas of our hands, right? Our thumb is roughly one serving of fat or two tablespoons. So if you look at each section of your thumb, one tablespoon, one tablespoon. So your full thumb, two tablespoons, which is like a full serving of peanut butter if you wanted to get that on a spoon. So you can kind of fig figure it out based on what your hand uh, matches up with on your plate. One little segment from your index finger is about one teaspoon. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking through making sure I got this stuff. Your palm is about three to four ounces. That's about a serving of meat. All right, so there's a few different ways to use your hand, your literal hand, to measure out the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins on your plate. I mean, how cool is that? Now, of course, I'm not sitting there putting meat on my palm. I'm not grabbing handfuls of rice and going, oh, it's a half cup. No, I'm visually comparing the two. Close my fist, hover it near the rice. Oh, look at that, it's about the same. 
You're not going to get an exact precise carb count this way, but that's okay. Right? Now, of course, what I teach my clients in our programs is precision, is how to predict stable blood sugars. Predicting blood sugars, that takes precision. But in our program, the entire goal, as I mentioned earlier, is freedom from diabetes, freedom to be able to live your life and actually enjoy it. Think about that. Enjoy the food in front of you. <laughs> what a concept, right? Now, of course, you do have to take into consideration the understanding that goes into these things. I wouldn't tell someone on day one after being diagnosed, oh, you closed your hand, that's a cup of carbs, and Google that. That's a lot of information to take in, right? Now, it's useful, of course, but in order to predict blood sugars, keep them stable, get accurate carb counts when out and about, two things. One, you have to know the knowledge beforehand. I have this knowledge in my head, this bank of how blood sugars respond. I had an active day before that. My lunch was higher in fat and protein, so I have to take into consideration a delayed rise. I have to look at the overall meal contents. I have to think about my post-meal activities. There's knowledge that goes into this, right? So once I have that foundation, then I can use that as a launch pad to get to a place where I can enjoy my meals while guessing how many carbs are in things with my existing knowledge base. Right? That's how I teach my clients the same thing. We spend the first couple of weeks mapping out the foundations. What's missing from your type 1 diabetes knowledge? What did your doctors never tell you? Let's figure that out first. Lay a solid foundation so you can jump from that to enjoying your food, enjoying your life, going for hikes. That is the key. Finding out how you can enjoy things and not be held back by type 1 diabetes. Right? So what we're looking at, overview of today. If you're going out to eat, obviously having a solid foundation helps. You want to make sure you get all your bases covered. Is my insulin to carb ratio correct? Are my basal insulin settings correct? Correction factor. Do I know how exercise impacts blood sugars? Uh, do I know fats and proteins? Like those are all super, super helpful. But if you're strapped for time and you're like, uh, Matt, I'm going out to eat in an hour <laughs> with family. How do I do this? Easy. Ready? Have grace knowing that you might not nail it. That's the first step. First step, if you're guessing at how many carbs are in there, have grace. Be ready for blood sugars to dip low, go high, and, and be ready to react with the appropriate strategies. And I'll get to those in a second. Step two though, use your hands, your magic hands, to figure out how many servings are in your meals. A fist, that's a cup, right? Cup of rice, that's 45 grams. A fist, that's a cup again. Uh, a cup of pasta, about 40 grams. Uh, cupped hand, cupped hand equals half cup. Half cup of black beans equals about 22 grams of carbs. And so we can piece together, obviously this is more useful with things that you can actually fit into a cup. If it's like a sweet potato, that's just a whole sweet potato, you can't fit that into a cup. But if you were to dice it up, huh, now it fits into a cup. You can kind of get creative with this. And obviously it's not a perfect system, but we're not going for perfect right now. We're going for enjoying the meal with the best that we can put forward. So, look at your hand. How can we use it as a measurement? The palm, to measure meat, three to four ounces. Cupped hand, half cup. Your thumb, about a serving of fats, or two tablespoons. Top of your finger, a teaspoon. A closed fist, one cup, and there's different variations of this that we can use. How exciting is this? You have a measuring device connected to you, literally. Use that to your benefit. Now lastly, I mentioned reacting. What happens if you do all of that you try to count your carbs, try to give it your best go, and things don't go according to plan. Maybe you go low halfway through your meal. Crap, order a soda, right? <laughs> How can I react to this situation? It's obviously a danger zone. We don't want to risk going low because lows can be immediately dangerous. We can get some immediate consequences. What about a high blood sugar? Uh, right after you finish eating, you check your CGM. How are we doing? Oh, no. You got 202 with an arrow up, right? Not ideal. But how do we react to those situations? We keep calm, logically think back to our foundational knowledge, right? What can I do? What can I do in this moment? What is one step that I can take to help future me experience a better result? Well, I can go for a walk. Hey fam, who wants to go for a post-meal walk? you may get differing results. Sometimes they're like, no, we're going to a movie. Other times they might say, hey, yeah, the weather's nice, let's go for a walk. That's gonna help bring your blood sugars down. 
drink some more water, maybe you gotta take some more insulin. The reactive strategies are also as important as the proactive strategies. Now proactive sets you up for success, reactive helps you to get out of a bind if you mess something up or if something was unpredictable, right? And using these strategies, you should be able to go out, enjoy food, have fun with your friends, have a night out with your family, go on a date night, enjoy the food. Don't worry too much about, I need to get this perfect, but rather, I'm gonna do everything I can to set myself up for success do what I think I need to do to guarantee that success and then accept that I might not have a perfect night, but I'm going to enjoy it anyways, right? So hopefully these tools are necessary, not necessary, hopefully these tools are helpful for you to enjoy a night out at a restaurant, going out to get food. If you don't have the carb count, remember you actually can Google a lot of the restaurants around your area. Most of them are probably chain restaurants that have those nutrition facts online. So use those wisely. Obviously I don't have time to jump into the different macronutrients and how fats and proteins affect blood sugars and the exercise that I had beforehand, insulin sensitivity, manipulation, all that fun stuff. But if that stuff picks your curiosity, if you like that next level a kind of idea of knowing the foundational elements that go into my decision making, and you wanna know more about the, the freedom side of diabetes, being able to go out to eat twice in one day while moving a fridge and walking around town and staying 100% in range that whole time, then I invite you to go check out Diabetes in Action. Highly recommend it. This is the same process that I use when I coach my own type one diabetic clients. It's the same stuff I use on myself and I'm sharing that with you. So if you haven't already checked that out, go look it up, diabetesinaction.com. It's also a link below this video if you're on YouTube. If you're listening to the podcast, you're gonna have to type it in yourself or check the description. And uh, at that website, you'll be able to plug in your email, grab a replay of a training that I did recently for free. It's a video training where I go into the 80-20 blood sugar formula that I mentioned earlier, right? Simplify diabetes so that you can enjoy your life, have freedom and control over your blood sugars. So last time, go check that out, diabetesinaction.com. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I'll see you next time and keep up the fight.